I, I have one of, the, one of the most amazing vantage points, I, I really do, to watch our church family, although we're not perfect, fellowship together, serve together, use our gifts and our talents together, gather together on Sundays and Sunday nights and Wednesday for Bible study. It's just wonderful. It really is. It's just wonderful. Using gifts and talents. Does anybody know, notice uh, anything different with this room? What's different about the room? Anybody? Did you notice? How many people have noticed what's different with the room? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? You know, it's amazing how many people noticed. Now I'm going to be, well, what was wrong, Pastor? <laughs> well, you know, gifts and talents. Someone came to me this week and said, uh, Pastor, I'd like to fix the crack. And I said, which one? <laughs> yeah, and uh, we just thank Tim and his, uh, his leadership, and uh, Tim and Roger and Doug came in here on Thursday, and they spent the morning, and uh, they fixed our, our lovely crack. You see, if I would stop preaching so loud, we wouldn't have that problem. Uh, so we brought in the reinforcements, and it looks nice. You know, they did a really nice job doing that. You know what, friends, if you notice something or you'd like to do something in the church, let us know. Maybe you are not the most skilled person at uh, fixing a crack or uh, painting a wall or uh, doing something, but let us know if you, if you notice something that you'd like to do and uh, want to contribute to, to helping us in that, in that capacity, let us know. Uh, this is a wonderful place to spend a morning, let me tell you. It really is. Joni, she's got a grin on her face already as soon as I say that. It's a wonderful place to spend a day, isn't it, Joni? Yeah. Yeah, or a week. That's right. And uh, some, some people even enjoy it so much they spend the night. And, uh, you know, every once in a while I think we should change the sign on our church to having one of those uh, rotating signs. We could change it to Southport Bed and Breakfast. We could change it to... Uh, the joy, the hospitality, uh, there's so many things that go on inside our church building, and it is just wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. Last Sunday, we, we talked a little bit about Paul. We dove into Paul's life today. I want to spend some more time talking about Paul. I want to continue our theme this morning on perseverance, and let me tell you, I am receiving more and more people that are sending emails or text messages or phone calls that are saying, Pastor, thank you for encouraging us to persevere this year because this is right where uh, the Lord is, is, is encouraging me and my life to go, is to persevere through some of these things that are going on. And uh, so thank you for that. Your encouragement means more than you'll ever know to me. So thank you uh, for being obedient and uh, encouraging me when you feel the need to do that, because uh, it is very important that, that we encourage one another. And so I really want to edify uh, that this morning. If you brought your Bibles with you, or your electronic version of choice, as most on this row do, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 7. And we are going to examine this portion of Scripture today. And, but let's stand this morning and read this portion of the Bible. Can we do that? Let's stand and read the word of the Lord today. Acts chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, and it says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived at Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. 
And when they opposed and revealed him, he shook out of his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius, Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Jaleel, the Jews, made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Jaleel said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names on your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized the ruler of the synagogue and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Jaleel paid no attention to any of this. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word this morning. You may be seated. So this morning, this morning what I want to do is I want to focus for a few moments on Paul's ministry. As we see here recorded in the book of Acts chapter 18 verses 1 through 17. He's in a place called Corinth. And Corinth, a prosperous Roman city widely known for its idolatry and immortality. And as we will see, it would become an opportunity for evangelism and a target for God's miraculous power. There are three main things in these verses that I'd really like us to capitalize on this morning and and draw some things from. First, and we touched on this just a few moments ago, Christians are to view the use of their talents as methods of evangelism. I say this to almost everybody that I talk to that's involved with ministry. It doesn't matter if you're making a pot of coffee or if you're fixing a crack in the roof If you are doing something with your talents, all of those talents can and should be used as an evangelistic tool. Let me share share with you an experience that I had just this week. I love to visit, and I know some of you may say, well, Pastor, you've never come and seen me. Well, I'd encourage you to let me know that you would like me to come and see you, first of all, and I will make every effort that I can to come and see you. I really will. Even if maybe you have to wait a little bit of time, I will make the effort to come, I assure you. And one of those opportunities was this past week. And, and this person had waited about two weeks to, for me to come and be able to come and, and be with them. And uh, so there was two weeks of planning that the, this person had on, to their advantage, so to speak. And you'll, it'll make sense to you as the story unfolds. So I arrive at this home, and uh, this, this person want, would, would like some prayer, and that's something that I enjoy to do with people as well. I, I don't think you can really be in this profession and not enjoy praying for people. And so I, I was invited over to pray for this individual, and when I got to the home, there was more than just this individual. There was a couple of people there, which again is not uncommon. And I quite prefer it, actually, when there's more than one person in the home. And 
uh, I didn't think anything of it, and I, I'm having conversation with this person, and, and uh, eventually we, we start to pray, and, and I, I turn the conversation to why I'm there, because sometimes you can get off, and you know how that goes, and uh, you leave, and oh, I forgot to do what I was supposed to do there, right? And uh, so I turned the conversation so that we could uh, get, that, get, get the prayer and, and spend some time in prayer together. And, uh, and the person said, and pastor, I just wanted you to meet my friend. And now we're going through the room. And I called my friend because I knew you were coming and you'd pray for them. And so I prayed for them. And then I prayed for the next person. And while that was going on, she was on the phone and she was calling more of her neighbors over. Hey, the pastor's here. You can come and you can receive prayer. And while that was unfolding, not only was she doing that, someone else was on their phone texting. Hey, you can come and you can receive prayer. And before I was done, there was over a dozen people in the living room. And we were having church. We were having prayer. And it was wonderful. We use our gifts and our talents as a tool for evangelism. Are you following me this morning? So, I'm a pastor. So, with that, I have some gifts and some talents that make that possible. Some of you are like, man, you need to really work on some of those. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, maybe I do, I don't know. But So, you use your gifts and your talents. I was using what God has given me. In that moment, the purpose of that moment, I believe, was to evangelize in that moment, to pray with people. I later found out that that's exactly what was happening in that room. There was a person that was there, very quiet on the couch, and had been there for the entire time, and I found out that this person wanted to Make a decision to follow Jesus. Isn't that cool? So the last prayer in that room this week was a prayer leading someone to Jesus Christ. Using our tools, using our gifts, using our abilities for evangelism. Now, this week, I get the privilege of going back and dropping off a Bible. Isn't that awesome? To this person, because the person wanted a Bible. So I will do that this week, is drop off a Bible and invite to church. That's awesome, isn't it? Christians are to view the use of their talents as methods of evangelism. We see here verses 1 to 3. We'll read them again. Paul left Athens, went to Corinth, found a Jew named Aquila and his wife Priscilla. And because he was of the same tribe, he stayed with them. And they were working for, for by trade as they were tent makers. This means, friends, that in Corinth, Paul met a couple who were tent makers and who became his friends. And although the Bible does not say they were Christians prior to meeting Paul, we can be sure if they did not already know the Lord, that Paul would have certainly helped them come to know him. The point is this morning that Paul regarded his ability as a tent maker as an opportunity for evangelism. Second this morning, Christians must believe that as they increase their efforts in evangelism, there will be an increase in the number of people who will come to Christ. This is not something that should surprise us. As we increase our amount of, so to speak, evangelism that we do, then it's only common sense that the more we do, the more people come to know Jesus Christ. At least that would be what we would expect. Right? I can remember stories my, my grandma used to tell me. And uh, my grandma, before she passed, she, she always loved to tell stories. And uh, she also loved to drive fast. I was recalling this. I seen a picture on my computer this week of my grandma. 
And uh, my grandma loved to tell a story, and she loved to drive. And uh, occasionally, when I was younger, I'm told, I can tell this story now, uh, when I was younger, she would drive until I would fall asleep. And every time a stop sign came, I would wake up. So, Doug, close your ears. <laughs> so, out west, I grew up on the prairies, and out west, you can see for miles, and you can see cars, and so she justified it that she could see for miles, and whenever there was a stop sign and I was sleeping, she'd just drive through. <laughs> it solved the problem, but she loved to drive, she loved to drive fast, she loved to tell stories. And I, I can always remember some of the stories that she'd tell of old Pentecost days when people would get together and they would have tent meetings. When they would have Sunday night church. And I'll never forget when she would tell me about her church in Perry Sound. When they would go for Sunday school and they would have their church service on Sunday morning. And many times the church service would spill over into the lunch. And then that would spill over into the Sunday night church. And she would tell a story of how they'd be at church all day. And still have to get up and go to school in the morning. Evangelism. The more evangelists. See, they knew that principle. This is a generation that that promoted the bus ministry. And seen the bus ministry grow. This church had a bus ministry. where People came to church. You know what? I just talked to someone just in the last month that was picked up, it was just this week. Brian, it was on Friday at lunch. And our waitress, our waitress at Swiss LA in Owen Sound was telling us at the table, I don't even know how the conversation started, but these kind of conversations, they just happen. Serving us our chicken dinner, and just out of the blue, she starts talking about how she lives in Southampton or lives in Port Elgin and drives by the church. And she used to come and be picked up by the bus ministry here at this church. And she'd just come back to the area, and she, she told Brian and I, so I mean, it's public, she told Brian and I, I've been looking for an opportunity to come back to church. And I just started to laugh, didn't I, Brian? <laughs> I said, I don't know how much more clear God can be. He sent us here. And we were supposed to eat at the Chinese restaurant. And now we're here. So, you know, evangelism. Evangelism. Have we lost some of that edge? Are we doing as much evangelism today in 2017 as we were? I think that we we are doing equal, but just in different ways. But maybe some of those ways aren't as effective as what they could be. Verses Verses 4 to 11 state, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, And Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, testifying that Jesus was the Christ. Some resisted and blasphemed. Others, including the leader of the synagogue and all of his household, believed in the Lord. Following this, Paul settled in Corinth for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among the people. Notice some truths. Just some simple things in these verses. First, up until the time Paul began intensifying his effort in soul winning, there is no record of great numbers coming to Christ. Second, the number of Christian workers grew, so did the impact of the church. And third, for a year and a half, the church enjoyed great success in Corinth. What is this saying to us this morning? I believe that it's challenging me and maybe you that 
sometimes we feel that we need to have this in place and we need to have this in place and we need to do this before we go. And while some of those things are great and I believe in order and I believe in organization more than ever before, I believe in preparing ourselves before we go out more than ever before, don't get me wrong. But sometimes we spend so much time, I believe, in the preparing that we forget to go and go out and do. We spend so much time in this environment, which is okay, don't get me wrong, we need to be here, we need to be in Bible study, we need to be in church, it's important. But as we are getting strengthened here, it should make us even more eager to go out there and proclaim Jesus, and to talk about Jesus, and what He's done in our lives. Do you know what was interesting about our conversation at Swiss Chalet on Friday? Was up until the moment Jesus was mentioned, it was just a casual conversation. As soon as Jesus was mentioned, it opened up a whole realm of different conversation that she will never forget. And quite frankly, we probably won't either. Even though I thought it was a month ago and it was just on Friday. I'm really okay, honest. <laughs> and I slept last night too. Friends, I think you know the cry in my heart by now. We've known each other for a long time. And there's still some empty seats in here that I believe have people's names on them, so to speak. People that you know, people that you rub shoulders with at work or at school. Maybe a family member or a neighbor that's more interested than you maybe are aware in what's going on in your life that you can point them to Jesus Christ. What else I think this is speaking to us about this morning is I don't think we have to look far to realize that this world is full of sin. This world is full of filth and dirt. We don't have to look any further than outside our doors or even on our phones and devices to realize how much filth is actually in the world. But we are still called to go and proclaim the truth and to let our light shine and to bring people to relationship with Christ. But we can't bring people to relationship with Christ if people can't get to know us first, individually, collectively, as people. One of the things I'm always inspired by is the story of missions. And I remember when Heather and I were in school and we had a really great missions teacher that I've never forgotten some of those lessons that or lectures that we were we were taught. And one of them that's really stuck out in my mind over the last number of years and today as I share this with you today is how important it is that when you go out on the mission field that you learn the language that you study the culture so that you can go and minister into that land. You know, friends, it's no different being here and viewing this community, this beautiful community of Sogging Shores as our mission field. Learn the language. And I don't mean the English language. Learn how they communicate. Learn how they make friends. Be their friend. Associate. Don't be of. We don't have to be of the world to have a friend outside. Do you know that? Some of the best conversations I have are with people that are not Christian people. I would say, Pastor, how can you do that? I love to do that. I mean, if we are, if we are just associating with ourselves, 
And although that's great, we're not really evangelizing much, are we? Unless we're evangelizing to ourselves. But go out into the community and share what Christ has done for you. Every opportunity that you can. Somebody that, that I love to go out with, and I wish I could go out with more, and I've referenced it before, is, is Howard. I love to go out with Howard. He's a guy that just capitalizes on going out and mingling with people. Another one is hey, Roger. He loves to go out and mingle with people. I love to go out and mingle with people. Sometimes it makes Heather feel a little uncomfortable, I think, sometimes, because I just like to talk to anybody. I'll talk to anybody at all. Anybody. Doesn't matter where they are or what's going on in their lives, I'll talk to them. As long as they'll talk to me, and sometimes even if they don't want to talk to me, I'll make sure I talk to them. In fact, sometimes if people are trying to get away from me, I'll go around and make sure I, hey, how are you? And you fill a pool with hot water and you call it a hot tub, and oh, that's a whole nother level. That's a whole nother level. Finally, Christians must remember that as their lives unfold under the supervision of God, He means what He says. In verses 10 and 11 through 17, two amazing things take place. First, Paul has a vision. And in the vision, the Lord spoke words of reassurance to him. He was told to not let afraid paralyze him. He was instructed to continue to serve the cause of Christ and to leave the details of his life to the Lord. Second, Paul witnesses an outstanding miracle which can only be explained as a supernatural intervention of God. In verses 12 through 17, Paul is before the tribunal. It is the desire of some that Paul be tried and sentenced as a lawbreaker. It appeared nothing is going to stop this from taking place, except for one thing, the presence of God in Paul's life. And in an amazing turn of events, we are told that they could find no fault with Paul and dismiss the charges. As a result, the leader of the synagogue, instead of Paul, was beaten, and Paul was able to continue to freely minister to the people at Corinth. But there's more to this story. According to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1, the leader of the opposition eventually became a Christian. Compare these two verses with me this morning. Acts chapter 18 verse 17 says, And they all took hold of Sosthenes, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 says, Paul called as an, as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sothenes, our brother. This means that the opposition failed. The circumstance was reversed. And as the Lord took the situation in hand, he proved what he says will happen, will happen. It's very important, friends. Let me go back to our first point this morning. It's very important that we use our talents to help forward the kingdom of God upon earth. That as we increase our effort in soul winning, the Lord will reward our effort. And although at times it will be difficult serving the Lord, He will make a way for us to do so. We need to persevere. It may not always be easy, but we need to persevere through the good times, through the bad times, through the difficult times, through the happy times. We need to persevere because, friends, there's a whole community out there that needs to know Jesus Christ. Last Sunday afternoon, I was at the arena skating with my family on Sunday afternoon. 
And I've said this to you before, and it was a reminder once again last Sunday afternoon as I was skating in a circle several times on that rink. All these people call this place home. I wonder how many of them have a church family. I wonder how many of them know know Jesus. Not just know Jesus, but have a personal relationship with him. I believe that you could know Jesus and not have a personal relationship. You could know about Jesus and not have a personal relationship. And the human part of me began to feel sad for people that don't have what we have. Here we are, we're gathering here on a Sunday morning, and for the most part, we're excited to be here. We're excited to serve the Lord. There's a whole lot of people out there, friends, in our own backyard that don't know Jesus Christ. And we need to tell them. We need to tell them about Jesus. I'm not suggesting necessarily that you you get up on a milk carton and start preaching. I'm not suggesting that necessarily. But what I am suggesting is be available. Be interested in getting to know people. And watch for the opportunities as God opens those opportunities up. Because like we've seen here in the story, even though there was all kinds of sin, all kind, it was a rough period, it was still a tremendous opportunity that God used. So yes, we live in a time where it's tough, but we persevere and we spread the gospel. We share Jesus. We talk about the cross to all who will listen in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's just pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you once again for the privilege we have to gather in this room this morning. And Lord, we are humbled that you would use us. Lord, we're humbled that you use us as we are. Lord, help us to be aware of the opportunities to share your love with those that are around us. Lord, we pray today for the strength to persevere. We pray, Lord, that as we go about our day today, that we would be looking for opportunities to share your love with people that are going to be in our, in our homes, in our workplaces, in this community, our neighbors. And that, Lord, that we would have a hunger every day to serve you, a hunger to read your word, a hunger to pray, a hunger to get to know you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the freedom in this country that we can enjoy. Help us to never take it for granted, Lord, and to use every moment getting to know you and to sharing your love with others. And Lord, this morning, teach us to pray as you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.